Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's program. We are talking about verses for special occasions, and for that, we bring in sort of our resident poet, and that would be Sue Chambers, who is a, a member of mine, was talking before this that she's really missing not being able to be here for exercise and especially the, the warm water pool, but we're hoping that soon that will change and we'll have people running through the hall. No, maybe not running, but moving <laughs> briskly and conversing in the halls of mine, faith and action. So I am going to step aside and let Sue take over and tell us about the writing verse for special occasions. Okay, thank you very much, Mike. Um, and uh, you know, I've been writing poetry since I was a, a teenager, um, and it's it has been a family event in some ways uh, because um, my mother was a poet and very active in a national organization and local, state, and ch city chapters. And she, she, when I was an adult, she said finally said, "Okay, now you're done with your law school and all your other things. You need to get back to poetry." And that's when I joined the Southern Minnesota Poets, which is the local chapter here, which meets on Saturday, the second Saturday of every month. And I warmly invite you to this Saturday's um, uh, SMPS meeting that's coming up because Zoom has been great for us. We've been able to invite poets from all over the country. And our, our poet that is speaking on Saturday is from Texas. So if you want more information, uh, to see me, but the second Saturday of every month we meet, we usually have a speaker and we, we share poetry and do read arounds and uh, sometimes write. Then we have the League of Minnesota Poets, which is the state chapter that all of the 11 chapters in Minnesota belong to. And then from there we have the National Federation of State Poetry Societies. And I've stayed active in all three of those organizations uh, for a very long time. Um, and there are a lot of contest opportunities and publication opportunities in each of those organizations. So if you're getting yourself a manuscript together, there's, there's places there for you to go and see about that. Both of my children write as well um, and participate at times in some of those organizations. So it's nice to have it continuing in the family all the way through. And it's a great thing to share. So um, I hauled kids off to these kinds of meetings even when they were five or six. Um, and I didn't worry if they just read in the corner because I knew it was soaking in <laughs> and they were getting exposed to it. And that's been the, that's been the, what's happened. Um, I'm hoping my grandson who is 17 for a while, he was writing poetry, then he stopped and it wasn't cool anymore, but now he's 17 and starting to date a lot of girls. And I, I suddenly he's beginning to see the benefits of poetry again. <laughs> so we'll see whether he comes up with some things. So I'm gonna share a few poems today, um, but I'm also um, hoping that you will do some writing. And we know when we share, after writing that it's not a finished poem. We know that people go back and do a lot more rewriting later, but just sharing gives you a chance to hear it because poetry is an oral um, product as well as the written. Uh, and that's important in, in this process. So um, I'm hoping that some of you will share as well. Now I'm going to pull up my Make sure I get the right one. There we go. I can get it to go. I don't know why it's not going. Let me try again. <laughs> Huh. It was following along all the steps. Yeah, and yeah. I did everything that I was supposed to. Let me slide out for a second because I do want that. Um, there was some note about signing in to something. I don't know if that mattered. I'm going to come back to this, pull it up again, go to here.
All right. Um, no. I'm going to try one more time now. I have to get back into a different screen. There it is. Oh, that's, uh, you don't need to worry about that one. That's just, it should just go. There we go. So um, I might, I, I'm going to apologize to Mira right away um, for the Christmas theme that's in all of this, because this is uh, actually a presentation for any kind of event um, poem. I don't think there's anything that locks me up faster than for somebody to say, I want you to write a poem about um, world peace or coronavirus, any of the big events. Um, but I, I suggested this to Mike because we were around the holiday season and I focused on the season I know. I would hope that Mira would write some incredible Hanukkah poems. Um, I, I do write a lot of solstice poems, light and dark and uh, those things and, and enjoy that too. But you, I do suggest that you write what you know because I'm especially later as I talk about things, I'm gonna talk about detail is what makes the event poem work. Um, so oh, uh, there's contact information if you need to get um, hold of me uh, and I'll let Mike work with that later too. But I do always like to say, um, poets break the rules all the time. There's nothing I can teach you um, that you don't already know. And so uh, I, I like Richard Hugo and his, in the, a book he has about writing poetry um, that keep that crap detector on because it might not be right for you. And um, what we want you to do is find what works for you and decide when you want to break the rules. I do want to talk a little bit about what poetry is just before we got, this is sort of a refresher for a lot of you because I know we, I've spoken here at Vine before and we talked about some of the basics of poetry, but I think poetry is different than prose. Prose can be very, um, uh, general and paragraph prosy type of, of language talks about a lot of things that appeal to the thought process. Poetry appeals to the heart. It's, it's just emotion based more. Uh, it's more sensuous, it's more emotional. It has a music to it. And whether you rhyme poetry or just have a beat, there's a tightness about it, a concreteness um, being uh, much shorter than going on for 500 pages. Um, I love a novel, a good novel too, but poetry should be able to give you that gasp of recognition and emotion within one or two lines and certainly within a few stanzas. Um, and so poetry just tends to be much shorter than the prose does. What's um, the primitive? The primitive is the going to the gut, going to the, uh, the really going for uh, the, the, the raw emotions, whether that's happiness, sadness, um, it's, it's working with those things that appeal to us on a caveman basis. Um, most poetry has some special tools. Uh, one of our biggest tools is the use of metaphor. That is comparing something to something else. Um, metaphor is much better than simile. Simile uses like or as. Um, metaphor is the thing. So instead of saying I'm angry, which is just telling and, and doesn't have simile or metaphor, you say I am like a thunderstorm, which is the simile or a metaphor, I am a thunderstorm, which is just much stronger. Um, and I like both of them, but I usually am always able to turn a simile back into metaphor. And metaphor is really helpful in poetry. Sometimes it comes a little bit later. It doesn't always come in the immediate writing. It may come as you begin to look at the poem, but a lot of times you'll find instinctively you do it as you start to write. 
Um, there is rhythm in almost all poetry. There's, there's a, a working with the lines and trying to keep them in a, a similar beat. Um, sometimes there is rhyme. Uh, sometimes it's free verse, but when, it's always tight and it always has music. Um, another great book out there, it's an older book uh, called Western Wind by John Nims, um, really talks about imagery in poetry. Um, and imagery is usually best uh, invoked through using the senses, uh, the five senses. And the more of the senses you can get into the poem, um, the more imagery you're going to have, the more it invokes that, that inviting the reader into the poem to be a part of it and participate. Because when I read about grandma's baking bread with the cinnamon smell wafting up, I can taste that bread. I can feel that bread. I can smell that bread. It really invites the reader to become a part of it. So working with imagery is important in poetry. And the more concrete images are, the better. It, it, lots of, there, we do all sorts of abstract words without thinking. Most of the telling words are abstracts, uh, such as angry, sad, happy, uh, those types of things. The more detail and more concrete you have of something, the more the images come. Cactus, mud, beer bread. You know, those types of things are very specific and they help us um, to get a better image of what is going on. So we try to get rid of the telling words. And I think the telling words are probably one of the reasons why these big themes feel scary when you're first asked to write on them. Because um, if you look at the news media when talking about the pandemic, they're talking abstracts all the time. You know, these trying times that we are living in, you know, that we're struggling. Well, those things don't give us images. So uh, they're a, a little bit too abstract. Um, uh, and I think that's what sometimes can arrest you if you, if you go at them directly to try and write the perfect peace poem or the perfect Easter poem or the perfect Hanukkah poem. Um, you, you sometimes need to find different ways to get to the concrete and get away from the abstract. Um, I also suggest you can't do too much reading of poetry of others or listening to other people with their poems and writing on a regular basis. My daughter and I, uh, a few years ago, maybe about five or six years ago, challenged each other to write a poem a day. And what we did is kept a notebook on the kitchen counter and each of us would take a day and, and just give an assignment to trigger writing. And we gave each other permission to write the worst junk we'd ever written. Um, and what happened is we had some terrible junk, that was fine. But we also had, uh, with that 365 days, we, we had some great poems. And in fact, we actually went about a year and a half writing. And I found it changed the way I write poems. Uh, I, there's a joke about uh, me at, at writing retreats now because we get our writing assignment and I can churn out two or three poems in the time it takes other people to write the one poem during their writing exercise. I found I started to write shorter poems and that helped that. But just, just letting yourself go and just writing on a regular basis um, frees you from that editor that stops you from writing. Um, when I hear about writer's block, I, I think one of the best things I can recommend to people who have writer's block is free yourself by just writing every day and don't worry about what you're writing. It doesn't have to be good. It doesn't have to be of a certain um, requirement of, of what you're going to accomplish. Just write because the more you write, it's like golfing, uh, you know, the, the better you'll play. Yeah, yes, maybe you'll get that hole in one if, you, if you'd never have played, but most likely it's gonna take a lot of practice. And so I say, practice your writing. That's also Natalie Goldberg's uh, recommendation. And she has a great writing practice that she uses um, over and over to help people write. And I like these rules, so we're gonna use them today. 
the first rule number one is keep your hand moving on the page. Once you start writing, don't be an editor. Don't stop and pause and go, oh, that's a terrible word. I'm not gonna do that. Don't scratch, don't edit. Just keep that hand moving and don't worry about. Um, you can rewrite at a later time. Rule number two is lose control. Stop being the editor. Don't worry about spelling. Don't worry about grammar or punctuation. Again, in the rewrite process, you can always do those things. But for now, you're just gonna go where it takes it. Rule number three is be specific. Use very specific language. Don't use general words like trees, grass, flowers, cars, streets. Instead use uh, willow tree, uh, dandelions, uh, roses, you're just going to have a very different poem if you, the more specific you get. Don't think about it. Uh, that again is letting your editor take control. And if you are so contemplating, I have to do it this way, you're not just going with it and you're not letting your subconscious take over and the subconscious can give us some wonderful surprises. So the more you just let yourself be free and just write, um, the more likely you are to get surprised by the quality of what you end up with. Oops, I went too far. I gotta go back one. Rule five, the, the, again, no editing. Don't worry about how it looks on the page. We can fix that at a later time. For the first write, what we're trying to do is inspire you. We're trying to get you to move out of comfort zones and just start writing. Give yourself permission to write the worst junk you've ever written um, because you will surprise yourself by writing very good stuff when, when you don't worry about what it's at. Uh, William Stafford had a line that said, um, uh, um, once I began to write every day, I forget quite how it went, but he said, um, I had to lower my standards. It was important and that helped him to write. So lower your standards. You don't need to be perfect at this time. And then rule number seven is go for the juggler. There's a lot of times when people begin to panic as they're writing something down. They go, oh, um, uh, I can't write about that. That would really hurt the feelings of my grandmother if she knew I, I was saying that about her. But you need to in poetry, that's important. That's that primitive, that raw emotion. And even if it is not true, um, it, if it enhances the poem, you should be doing the, the, the more brutal things, such as having your grandma slap you, even if she never did in real life, um, because the drama of that may be what the poem calls for. <laughs> the other thing I ask for today is, and this is again, because we're talking about big events, we really want to stay away from trite expressions. And um, Christmas holiday especially lends itself to, you know, the, the cards that are out there we see over and over again. We see the same language year after year. Um, the hymns are all the hymns that we know and have, have loved for years, but they don't have a place in the poem. What we want you to do is find a new way of saying something um, and not going for the catch-all phrases that are just there. So, uh, and sometimes you'll have to do that on the rewrite itself, but even as you're working with it, if you're starting to say, oh, I wanna deck the halls, think about another way of saying that. We all know why you're using deck the halls, but find a different way of saying it. Avoid the trite expression and go for something new and original. Peace on earth, goodwill to men. You know, it just, it's just, it's been said so many times. We just want to approach things with a new eye because that will surprise your reader and will invite them more into the, the whole experience. So I say to you, the best way to start to work with the big themes is to approach it sideways. Don't jump for the big, the peace on earth, goodwill to men at right away. Find another way of getting into your theme. 
So we're going to start with the writing exercise right away. Um, and uh, what I suggest you do is just look at what's in front of you and now begin to describe it. I'm just going to have you write for a little while. And what I want you to do is use very specifics and give the details by using the five senses. Now, if you're like me, I'm, I'm facing a blank wall. Um, it's, you know, there's not, a, and my screen. Um, and I've done, I have written about the screen and the blank wall in front of me, but I'm gonna try something else. I'm gonna write about my hand. It's right there and in front of me. Um, and I'm going to do it. And I'm not gonna worry about it being a poem. I'm just going to, to start by writing and the easiest way is to pick the five senses and begin to write on those senses. So we're just gonna do this for a few minutes. So go ahead and, and pick something in front of you and begin to write on it. One surprised by what happened, where you went to. Did you get beyond description and suddenly find you were telling a story in, in what you were doing? That's usually what happens um, if you just let yourself go, that, that losing control. You, you start with just simple descriptions, but it's your mind does interesting things and begins to play with what could be done, um, where it wants to go. Um, so for in my hand, after doing quite a bit of describing, I began talking about what the hands know. And um, that went in an interesting direction, enough so that I'm now going to go back and really work with that. And that poem is not an event poem it, because it was just about hands, but it was a way of, of getting me going and getting me writing. Um, I am going to share a poem of mine. And this is a poem that was triggered by those assignments of day that uh, my daughter and I did. And again, I think it started with right about the first thing you see in the morning. And this is what came about. And this is an event poem. Before they wake, Christmas day. The Cardinal, colorless in first light, waits in the cedar tree. The empty feeder is stiff with cold. Above, there are still stars, but as you sift the seed down, the eastern ones blink out. The dog, ruffled and yawning, rounds the corner from her bed. Her breath hangs in spears above her. It is so quiet, you can hear the river under the ice. A morning like many others. You go back to the light and heat, you bring your family cups of tea to celebrate the day. Together, you will unwrap previous special mornings, now heaped up past 50. Some are so bright you must shut your eyes against their sparks. Others begin hushed, all gray, except for one cardinal in a frigid sunrise who blesses the bounty. So I trusted to the poem to know where it was going. I started with just what I was feeling and hearing and seeing um, as I went out and, and filled the bird feeder. Um, and it went where it wanted to go uh, and, and took me to the event. So that's approaching sideways to get into the event. I just talked about the morning and from there it came to what I wanted and I was able to tie the Cardinals back into the Christmas feeling. So that would be uh, a recommendation I would make for you is don't be afraid just to start the poem even if you don't know where it's going. So here's another option for us, uh, another writing exercise. Pick up one ornament and begin describing it. Now, maybe you don't have an ornament in front of you, but I know that everyone has some ornament in their mind that's a special ornament that they can do it. Um, or maybe for, for uh, Mira, it's, it's one of your menorahs uh, or something, but pick, pick an object that has fairly significance and just start describing the senses on it. And, Let's do a little more writing. Um, just take that ornament 
even if it's in your imagination or if it's one that's in front of you and try to get all five senses into it. Able to? Down one more idea and then we'll finish up. And if anyone feels brave enough, would anyone like to share even a portion of maybe what they wrote? I will share, Sue. Okay. It's not great, but it's that's, what it came. That's all right. That's, that's what we want. The shiny red and green plaid fans out from the peak to the base forming a three-dimensional festive fabric tree decked out in Christmas colors. Some small red bows adorn the tips of the branches as if it needed further decoration. Although there is no piney scent, the odor of love emanates from the tree. Wow. It does not make a sound, but I hear the words of love that are stitched into the tree. This tree, a gift crafted by my sister brings her to me during the holiday season, years after her death. Wow. See, and it went, it's a surprising way. It brought your sister very close to you and there's an emotional response to that at the end. The, the, the line about the sound, read that again. Um, um, there is no sound, but... It, it does not make a sound, but I hear the words of love that are stitched into the tree. Even stronger might be to take out that it doesn't make a thing a sound and, and just put in, I hear the words of love stitched in the tree. It's, you see how that brings it even more immediately and strong into there. So it, it's, it, it's powerful and it, it, it gets more and more powerful as the poem goes on because what looks like just an ordinary ornament suddenly is so important because it's the sister that's there. I, I, you've got a great, that's a great start to a poem. It's, it gave me goosebumps, <laughs> so. Well, thank you. Anyone else? I'll, I'll read you what I wrote um, because it, it was, I, I've, I've been, bereft of my ornaments. I'm Santa Claus crazy. I have a collection of 150 or so Santa Clauses and they're all in storage because we're living in a intermediate place that COVID has made go much longer. We've been here uh, almost a year, well, a year and a bit now. Um, and we thought we would have moved last spring or, or into the early summer. And it's just not happened because of COVID because we're waiting for um, a, a, a senior citizen co-op to open up. So. so I'm missing my ornaments and I had to do all of this by memory. The tipsy Santa, his eyes are crossed his goblet held near his ear is almost tipping. A whiff of bubbly brandy wafts up from him. Santa hiccups, his round belly bounces under his plush robe. The fur flutters with excitement. Each year, he emerges from the Christmas box in a chorus of deck the halls. You cannot help but laugh as you welcome him back. No one else is as jolly or glad to be with us. He cheerfully puckers his red lips, ready to whistle our season into a very special merry each day until he is repacked away some pale January morning. So, all right. And now I'll read another one um, that's a little more fi finalized, a little more formal. I have to move something over here though. Construction reflection. One woman weaves a string of lights through full green boughs. The house is quiet. The clock in the library chimes. She moves to the ornaments, 
but the silent air disturbs her pattern. So she drifts into the next room, shuffles through discs, starts cheerful carols wafting around the tree in her. No one is home. She's alone with the tree, music, and the thick snowfall outside her window. She goes back to the boughs, fills them with Santas, nutcrackers, stars, and sparkles. The tree begins to sing along. It shows off her mother's favorite bell, coyly drapes baby's first Christmas. The ornament the family brought at the ocean is hung next to her musical teddy bear. The icicle hum their remembrances from past years. She already sees new memories begin as she turns on the lights, tucks the boxes away. In the driveway, the dogs bark greetings to the first of family arriving home. Again, I just took the decorating of the tree and this obviously it's about more than one ornament, but that's what happens sometimes is you just go into those things. Don't be afraid to use humor in your poetry too. Sometimes when I use humor, I tend to speak in more modern language. I tend to use a casual tone. Um, you still need to keep some of the other rules, the using the senses, using the specifics rather than general words, but you can have a lot of fun with these, with a little bit of humor in there. And so uh, the next poem does that. You know the hassle of it all. Dusty boxes dragged down from remote shelves, lights wadded in a tangle mess. You told your son to do them separately, but look at them now. You thump down the stairs, you shouldn't carry this much weight. Then there's a tree, a tromp way out in a field. Your boots break the crust of last week's snow. Your feet and nose freeze while husband vetoes every selection. Too tall, too crooked, too hard to cut. There's a small trailer where you write the big check, get a dinky candy cane. Back outside, the tree is perched sideways on your car roof. Hubby wraps a million yards of twine through an open window. After a miserable ride with cold branches scratching at every corner, you finally get home. The top is too tall. The holder has sprung a leak, so a quick trip to Target. You can't help picking up a few more things. And oh, by golly, if I, I need to get busy on those greeting cards, I should have done that two weeks past. Oh, the bother of gathering up ingredients for all those old family recipes. You love them, of course, but the kids don't appreciate them. You end up throwing out half or gaining another five pounds. You know the hassle of everything, shopping in long lines. The size you want is always gone. And mercy, if you hear grandma got run over by a reindeer one more time, you're gonna throw your entire armload of wrapping paper into the two crowded aisles. Oh, it's all there, isn't it? All the deadlines, the inconvenient snowstorm keeps you pacing between newly decorated windows, the lost packages in the back of the closet. Watch out, get that cat out of the tree. But today, fresh snow, the sun strokes fresh snow. The tree is a rich story of other years. Tantalizing boxes are piled below. The kids come home this Friday. Your grandson will chuckle over the new cowboy Santa. You inhale Christmas, deep outs and ins. Sweet piano carols lures the Holloway close. You sip spicy eggnog. Hubby sneaks in a mistletoe moment. You snuggle below his beard. You think, not so bad, pretty nice house warm and ready, your Christmas feels hassle-free. Um, don't be afraid of going to sadness or loneliness or nostalgia too in these big theme times. Um, when you do that though, you don't wanna be telling. You don't wanna say, I'm feeling sad. You, you want to use understatement that usually works very well, especially in the bigger emotions. Um, 
and that there's power in the words if you're feeling sad that that's right about that there's power in that um and if you don't hold back i mean if you play the editor and restrict yourself and say oh i just shouldn't go there we want to keep christmas or hanukkah or one of whatever the season is all cheerful don't do that because there's a lot of power in what you're there and your own mind will take you where it needs to go and i have found even with the saddest of poems they tend to end on an upbeat note anyways they just working with it and then again you need the specific details and the five senses to launch your ideas. Can you say more about the understatement? I'll, I'll try to show it. And I'll, let me read the poem first and I'll try and show where the understatement is in this. Um, and, and we can talk about that a bit. Footsteps in the snow. Too often I look up discover autumn became winter while I was not paying attention. Not alert, night blankets me before I realize I lost afternoon. It's easy to inhale autumn colors, exhale winter. One ordinary Sunday, I acknowledged the change, unpacked the first box of decorations. Outside, the gray deepens to dusk. A set of footprints marks the new snow. They start out beyond the eye, somewhere near the field's middle and cross the border of my yard. Prints meander around the half-buried bridal's veil bush, planted after mother died. Clamber up the slight hill, aim for my front door. They're not my tracks. Mm. All afternoon, I've tucked safely around the fire. I read, dozed, listened to the radio. Now, I lift wobbly ornaments from battered boxes, unwilling to toss dented ones, reminders of dad's last carol. The snow hisses against the window. Footprints arrived at my front steps, although I never saw who came. That's the way it is sometimes. When you unpack Christmas, the dead come back to visit. One night, you're lulled into the peace of uninterrupted white. Next moment, footprints imprint across all your surfaces. The house fills with voices, half-forgotten scents, those you buried deep under your own snowdrifts. In this gentle storm, the painful ice burn of those gone softens at the edges. On the old porch, above footmarks no one claims, these festive lights spill down over the deep dark. Kindred flakes settle on my doorstep, begin to fill the ghostly tracks. I'd say the the understatement is somewhat in the in the the footprints who are which are never identified as to whose they are, although I give a pretty strong hint when you unpack Christmas, the dead come back to visit, um, and I think we all can feel that if you've done enough Christmases, there's a lot of people who are no longer with us when we pull out those ornaments. And I, Linda's poem was just another example of that, but I never once said, "Oh." You know they're gone i mean i do say you know i do say things like the bridal's veil bush planted after mother died so you know mother's died you reminders of dad's last carol so you know dad's died and there are reminders that are there but it's understated when you get down to the house filling with voices half forgotten scents those you buried deep under your own snowdrifts you never really say oh i'm missing them they were important in my life because you let the poem say that for you. Um, that's what I'm talking about with some understatement. And in this case, it's a sad poem. It's, it's not your normal Christmas poem, but it still ends on a, po a fairly positive note, the, the festive light spilling down over the deep dark. It's recognizing that difference between light and dark, um, if that makes some sense. Other comments about that? 
I'm wondering, Sue, I noticed there were a couple of spots where you changed words from what was on the page. I'm wondering how much you use <laughs> saying the poem out loud in the editing process. Um, I use it a lot uh, and I rewrite a lot. This poem was actually rewritten again before I put it up on the, on the, the screen, even though you'll notice a lot of the poems have dogs in them and cats. I haven't had a dog and a cat for about four years now. Um, so some of them are older and have just keep getting rewritten. Um, I, to me, I, I, I miss the animals, so it's nice to keep them somewhere in my life and the poetry allows them to still be there. Um, so, but I, yes, and you, when you are saying them out loud, there will come a time sometimes where you'll go, oh, if I added another alliteration sound, it will be even more rhythmic. It'll be even, it will read a little bit better. The other thing is the, I had a little bit of trouble with spacing to get it all on one page. Um, and I look when I'm reading through this way, I look and say, oh, I might want another stanza break there. I might want to do a, because I use stanza breaks as a way of taking a breath, a little pause between it's, that helps in performance readings of a poem, um, just to give that little pause in there. Um, this one has been played with a lot because it starts with autumn. It doesn't even start with the season, but I've I've deliberately kept autumn in there and did it by saying I didn't even know autumn had disappeared and now it's winter. Uh, yeah, uh, the, uh, and I think it works. I, I think it does work in here because it's it's sort of that that shifting of cycles that we all go through. So, um, but it it does mean that you keep rewriting and doing some reworking on it. I think this one um, has has won um, a couple of prizes, but it's never been published. It's one I, I that's not yet published. So um, I, I hope to it finds a home somewhere. It's always harder because if you put it out as a Christmas poem, it probably is too sad for a lot of people that are writing all the jolly Christmas poems, um, and for those that where you're submitting it to publishes publications that are not Christmas specific, it may be too Christmassy. Right. So you just have to find the right home for it to, to find a publisher. So can I ask a question? Yeah. <clears throat> when you sit down and write something like this, do you limit the time you spend on it? Or does it take an average of a half hour to kind of get the, the feel of it? You know, I, I, when I'm in the inspiration phrase, I really do try to, to work with Natalie Goldberg's idea of just writing and writing and just until it's, it gets finished. Um, and then I go back to the rewrite stage and um, the writing and writing, the, the, the first draft of this was probably three or four pages um, of handwritten. I tend to use a yellow sheet. I, I like to write on yellow pads, but some people, I can do it on the computer too, but I much prefer to see it this way and then start to play with what the shape of the poem is going to look like later. Um, and so when I do the three or four pages, it I usually go right on to the computer very quickly, like within an hour or two of having written the one or at least the next day. It doesn't always happen but you want to be in that same mood you want to have the same emotions still going in you and then i will do a first type written copy of it and by that time it's usually whittled down to two pages um, or maybe even one page and then i start to get um i start to discipline my child because up to that point my child has been allowed to run free and wild and do whatever and that's the time when i might look at a a stanza and say, okay, is that where that stanza really needs to go? Or should it be moved up or moved down? Um, I also look at first stanzas and last stanzas because what we tend to do when we're writing is we, we write in the first stanza whatever is triggering us. And the trigger may not be the true poem. 
So uh, like in the hand, I might have described the whole hand. I might take a lot of that out and go right into what became the theme of the poem. So I might throw out the first stanza. And then the, the reason I look at the, the last stanza is we tend in the stanza right above it to have hit the core, hit the important thing, the, the real gut emphasis of what we're doing. And then we're afraid people won't get it. So we write another stanza to explain what we had just done. <laughs> so you want to get rid of that and throw that out and say, no, let it speak for itself. And so there may have been another stanza here after this that I got rid of once I said, oh, okay, no, it's that it's the, the footsteps in the snow that need to be the emphasis here and that no one knows who they are, but they're disappearing now anyways, so. Thank you. I was noticing the structure and as it started, mm -hmm. I thought all the stanzas would be, you know, similar. So um, what is the, um, thinking or the rules about stanzas and how um, you make the breaks that you do. Um. <clears throat> okay, I, there's a couple of different answers to that. The first is if you are working in a form, you need to be very structured in whatever that form is. So if you're in a sonnet and it's an, an iambic pentameter, A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, you, know, the, you have to follow that. Free verse is a little different. And this is free verse, meaning there's, there's no rhymes at the end, mm -hmm. um, but there's still a structure. And again, I, I do kind of, my stanzas come because I see it as taking a breath. Sometimes it's, it's recognizing a shift in thoughts. Um, this, this is sort of a summarizing stanza here. Footprints arrived at my front door steps, although I never saw who came, you know, that type of thing. Um, and uh, you, you kind of play with it. Then what I do is I begin to look at it. This one was a little different if, on, on my other page where I don't have to have double columns and stuff. I, I may have been a little bit more three, three, four, three, three, four, and, uh, you know, have played with that. I sometimes will do that too, but there you have to make sure your breaths are coming at the right place for performing the poem. Um, and sometimes you can't. And I don't mind, oftentimes my last stanza might be more lines than other stanzas. But if I see, I'm looking at this now as you, as you talk about it and seeing that almost every stanza is either three lines or four lines mm -hmm. until you get down to here. Mm -hmm. And that might be something I'd want to play with and start, you know, just uh, seeing if I could structure that a little tighter into doing that, making it four lines. It means taking out some words, you know, to, to do it. But mm -hmm. I play with that a lot. I do a lot of rewriting and I do have um, a handout sheet that is tons of rewriting suggestions. That's a whole nother topic we could do sometime about the rewriting process. Um, there's lots of different ways to play with poems. And I sometimes will take two very short poems and merge them together into one, or I'll take a very long poem and break it into two poems or maybe even three poems as I begin the rewriting process. I, I, it takes me a while to be satisfied where, where I'm finally saying, oh no, I, I like the structure this poem is taking now and this is, this is it. And I'm, I'm kind of there with this one, but not maybe in the, the way you're seeing it on the screen. I'd have to go back and look at the, the, the one I have in, in my Word document because it may be just a little bit different because I had to get this one on the, all, all on the page and still be able to have you be able to read it. <laughs> and so I don't, I don't remember if it, that it's, it is more than four lines in the other one. I may have played with that a bit. Any other questions? Okay. So there, I, the last poem, and you may have heard me playing with it a little bit more again. You know, I told you um, uh, not, don't use trite phrases. Don't, don't just repeat the hymn. Don't repeat um, 
the the um, uh, things you've got on a Hallmark card. Instead, um, you know, find a new and unique way to say it. However, I also take trite phrases that we all know, and I sometimes use them and twist them sideways into new ideas. I kind of did that with the, the Tipsy Santa one that I'm just now beginning to work on it and we'll do some rewriting on. But um, I, I, I wanted to use some of the Merry Merry Christmas and deck the halls and things like that. So there you can deliberately break the rule of trite by using it in a way that surprises people. And this is um, my last poem, and, and that leaves us some time for some discussion. So let's, uh, but I've got one more writing exercise before we get to it. So, so now I am going to suggest, and maybe this is going to take a while um, for you to do, is consider taking current events, whether it's politics or it's Christmas at COVID time um, or something else and think about an aspect of that that calls to you. Um, I'm not asking you to make commentary on the events just to begin to describe what your emotions are, what, what is happening right now. So it's still using the specific details and still using the five senses to get into <laughs> that process. So this is, this is again, going to that big event, whatever, the, whether it's a holiday or it's uh, uh, the big news sensations that are going on around us. And then just begin to do the description of that and see where it takes you. This is the way you go into sideways into those big events is to work with that. Um, and we won't take the time to write on that now. I think this is one that you might want to take a deep breath or get a glass of wine <laughs> and, and sit down and let your mind go a little wilder and, and go freer. Um, but I, I would like you to be surprised by where that writing takes you. Um, let it, letting yourself go free enough so that you're surprised with, I didn't know that's what I was gonna be talking about when I started writing about this. And I'll share the one poem that I think probably does that a bit and was the way I did it. That's the reason I did it. Gotta move a few things out of the way. Making ready. One almost black cat sits patiently on the oriental rug. She watches flames reflected in brass stocking holders. The old clock counts the minutes. We wait together. Outside, fog has turned to droplets. Tonight, the heavy drips will float up crystal clean against midnight cold and our world will turn light. Christmas is still songs away. Family is missing. We cannot pull them down the old gravel road to greet the dogs or raise a cup with us. This evening, we breathe them in, call their names silently. They must travel far, struggle home through ice and wind. We let warm hearts reach out. We ring with Christmas. Our invitation beckons, even from a social distance. So there's one of those trite words, social distance. I mean, we're hearing that everywhere, but it's used in a different way. And it sort of makes this a little more contemporary, this poem, um, by pulling in that social distance, because then I think you begin to see that maybe family is missing and we can't pull them up. We aren't going to be able to have them there. So, you know, it, it's, it, and that was a surprise. It starts with just the description of what's happening right now, the weather outside, waiting, and then moves into something different. And I invite you to try that with some of your own writings. Discussion. <laughs> uh, 
we didn't have an example of any of the Lyme uh, approach or um, it was mostly the blank kind of verse. So are there some <clears throat> do's and don'ts when you get into that? Yeah, I think so. Um, and I tell you um, the forms themselves, I, what I usually do is start with a good form book, a good description of the form before I, I'm writing there. For me, I'm, I'm free verse is freeing for me. Um, and, and often the forms can be uh, more troublesome for me uh, because my editor takes over and I start working with that editor. There also, I think, needs to be a deliberate reason why you use the form you're using. Um, now, I did, there's, there's a form called the Villanelle, which is, it has repeating lines and it rhymes at the end. And I used the Villanelle in um, uh, a eulogy poem because it felt right. It felt like what it needed to be. It needed to be more formal. And what I usually do is I will take my page, my little written page, and along the right-hand side, I will put the stanzas out the way they're supposed to be. I'll just, and I will put A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, if that's the rhyme scheme that's going to be. And you need to know whether it's, um, you know, iambic pentameter or not. So if it's 10 counts across and you need to do that, I might even put little underlying areas before I even write a word. I just put the structure on the page so I know where I'm going. And then I go back to Natalie Goldberg's rules and I try to come up with a line, especially if there's a repeating line in that, in that form. Um, I will try to do that line first and then I'll put it in wherever it's supposed to be in the form and write it in. And then I'll go with Natalie Goldberg and I will write and I won't worry about iambic pentameter. I will worry about the, the rhyme at the end if it's, and I'll try to come up with those rhymes and make them work and then um, go through the poem that way and then begin the rewrite and, and worry more about the structure and make sure the structure is right. So it takes a little longer mm -hmm. um, to go through that process. Some people have an ear for that. You know, there, there's, I say there's as many different types of poetry as there are music. And um, my type of music is not the formal symphony <laughs> or, or the other structured types of things. My, my poetry is much more folksy, uh, folk song or, or, or new age. Uh, and so uh, it, it doesn't, I, I find what often happens is I will sit and I will write the structured poem and I'll work very hard on it and try to make it as good as I can. And then when I'm totally done with that, I'll turn around and I'll grab another fresh sheet and I will write the same poem again in free verse. And it's almost always better in free verse than it is in the structure. And I usually end up throwing out the structure. Now, having said that, I've done, I've had some awards for some blank verse, which is just the iambic pentameter with no rhyme at the end. And that's easier for my ear. That that music I can understand and I can do and I, I can make it work um, pretty well. Um, but my sonnets are terrible. <laughs> They're just not good. Um, and so I often will write a sonnet just for the practice of it, just for the exercise of it. And then I will go back and write it in free verse and end up with a much stronger poem. It's just, just the way I hear things. My beats are almost the exact opposite of of the the more traditional rhyming verse because that the, the traditional rhyming is da 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 and I tend to emphasize the first syllable do da da do da da you know so it's just different and um, it just works better for me to do free verse now there I do have an um, one thing I do love to do and I do a lot of this is syllabic writing. Um, where the syllable count is the same. There's so many small poems that are syllable counts only. Tonkas, haiku, uh, nanet, nanet. There's, there's just a million out there. If you, if you get on the internet and you um, just type in 
short forms, you're going to get a lot of syllable type exercises. And those are fun to do. And they're usually, because they're only 10 lines or less, they're usually one thought only there. And so I like doing those and syllable counts are easy for me. There's usually not a rhyming word in that. It's just the syllable count. So um, a lot of people um, will, will play with the syllable count only and, and work with that structure. And there I do the same thing on the page. I, I will, if, if there's a non-at form, which is it, you start with 10 syllables and then you do nine syllables in the next line, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, and the la last line has one syllable. And I will just write 10, nine, eight, seven them down the edge of my page. And then I'll just start working with that and go down. And it's nice if you can get those 10 lines and have just one thought, maybe one sentence in there. And it, 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 it's, it's, it's fun to play with. It's just a great way to play with words. <clears throat> Come back to where I can see everybody. <laughs> Other questions? Anyone want to share anything now? Well, I could read one more poem. This is out of my book, um, Good Thunder, Blue Earth, which is my book of farm poetry. It's a story of three generations uh, uh, of a farm family. And it tells a story, the whole, the whole book is full of the various characters. In fact, um, uh, it was done as a uh, reader's theater. Uh, Pat Ryan directed it down at the Twin Rivers Councils for the Arts and for an evening one time, which was just great fun. Um, but I'll read one that's got the holiday emphasis in it. This is, this is the younger generation. This is Lynette, who is in 19 or 20 years old. Vacation from Ag School. I love this old road. It winds around these hills like mid-morning coffee talk. My tires sing home for Christmas. For the first time since finals, I relax. Snow lies as a welcome mat across my familiar fields. Every, each neighbor's house is gift wrapped. Now I turn the corner, last country road before the gravel. I am almost home. Dad will look at the brochures I bring. We can talk about the newest techniques. Mom and I will edge around Robert Rodriguez, the boy in my biology lab. Maybe I will tell her what Rob said. He wants an equal partner on his farm. Next week, I pick up Kyle at the airport. We will speak about roommates, laugh over old family jokes. On Christmas Eve, we'll go to grandma's to sing carols. Grandpa will toast us with her eggnog if the doctor lets him. On Christmas, we'll unwrap love all day. Tonight, the cold stings my car window, but it can't touch my warmth. I twinkle back at the flakes dancing in my headlights. This is my holiday. Today, next year, my future is just around the corner. Sure. She ends up being the farmer in the family, not her brother, Kyle, of oh. course. Dad and Grandpa have to deal with that. <laughs> so, is this is this a kind of memoir? I mean, is this relating some of your own life or experiences? Or well, I lived for thirty years out by the Big Cobb River on eight point eight acres, but I was surrounded by farmers, and um, I just just grew to know them and grew to know the families. And I, I was a divorce attorney too, for years. And I did a lot of farm divorces. So I learned a lot of stories from mm -hmm. the things that go wrong in farms and, and what goes right. And so it just, it kind of all came together. It was funny when I began writing those poems was in the late, um, oh, in, in the 90s. 
And I remember picking up the phone and calling my mother who lived in Sioux Falls and saying, I've got these, a few farm poems and I, I don't know where this is going. I don't know what this is. And I called her the first week and said, I've got four of them. And then the next week I called and said, I've got 12 of them now. <laughs> and I ended up with 50. <laughs> so oh, it, it became a whole story and it took a long time. It, it took me about, um, I, I, one, one, I went through almost a, a full season, of a year of writing the poems and then changing the order of them. And then I sent it out to a publisher and got really positive comments, but a rejection and um, not realizing how great that was. I put it on the shelf saying, oh, well, maybe this isn't good enough. And I didn't look at it for about eight years um, and then pulled it down. And one of my very dear mentor friends who's not with us anymore, John Rosmerski, um, oh. then looked at that manuscript and said, this manuscript is worth developing. And he changed the order on a few things. And then I sent it out to another publisher and it got accepted right away. So don't give up on your stuff. <laughs> you know, you need to, you need to have faith in what you're writing. And I learned that lesson from that is, is, you know, you got to be thick skinned in, in working with publishers and, and others, because is it a story? with characters i mean did characters emerge out of this and yeah. it it's it's really a, that's why they were able to do the play that's right yeah it is a story with characters and and seasons um uh act one is the carlson century farm act two is turns act three is harvest and the cast of characters i don't know if you can see this I don't, is that hard to read? A little bit hard, yeah. But yeah, but grandpa. it's, yeah, it's grandma and grandpa. Um, it's Jake and Joe, the middle aged, and then it's the two kids, Lynette and Kyle. And then there's some minor characters, Bill the farmhand, Arnold Brocker, and then the Prangles, Asa and Mabel Prangle have, they're, they're a little minor, more minor, but that's, and there's a couple that are really more like a narrator. They're just an observe, observer in, in the abstract. And a, each of the sections starts with a, more of an observation, one, one poem or two on that. So, but it did end up telling a story. Mm -hmm. it, so, and that's, that's been fun. Mm -hmm. um, I, that was published in, um, <laughs> I've forgotten when, 20, when did I publish that? 2016? I'm not sure. I have, uh, it, it's been a few years. Um, it might have even been earlier. Twenty sixteen. No, it was twenty sixteen that it got published. So I'm about I'm nearly out of books. And um, Natalie Goldberg, who I cited to you, I, I happen to know her a little bit. Um, and she was a speaker for one of our conventions. And I gave her a copy of the book and she wrote back to me and she said, if you do a second publishing, I want to give you a blurb on the back. And I'm so excited about that because <laughs> she's really high caliber and, and um, I would love to have her do that. So I may do a second publishing of it. Um, there's always that temptation of rewriting it again. And I don't think I want to, since it's already been published um, and it's in its form. So I, th the other, I think- The uh, other part that it, it's um, uh, a way of <clears throat> um, keeping uh, the history of the rural life, you know, alive. It's, it's you know, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of what word I want to use to say that, but it's a testament yeah. to, to uh, rural living, um, and and some of it is being lost. So <laughs> yeah, and I there's actually a poem in there, the Arnold Brocker um, poem in here that is about him walking the beans, which nobody does anymore. Know, but but and it. Yeah. It, there's a discussion of, of the loss of that. So, yeah. 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 I, I'm trying to remember. Um, 
a poet, I probably could go grab the book. He's, he, he writes about really a brief um, poems about his rural um, growing up and, and it just captures so much. Yeah. Oh, I mean, um, and that's not getting, that's the sideways approach to it again. He probably, they're brief poems, so he just takes one topic and he doesn't expand on it in that poem. He just sticks to that and that works really well. So yeah, and, and he weaves humor into it so well too. Um, yeah, it, it was just a joy to revisit um, the farm in all its many, and I didn't grow up on a farm, but I, I grew up in a really small Iowa community where you could almost see the rural from. <laughs> yeah, that's that, and that was me too. I hadn't grown up on a farm, but I certainly have it immersed in me now. So, yeah. so I hope all of you write an event poem, I may, whether it's about COVID or Christmas or Hanukkah or solstice. Um, Please try your best, but go sideways at it and, um, you know, have a little fun with it. Enjoy it. All right. Well, thank you. I wanted to pass along. Shelly had to take off, but she wanted me to make sure that she, that I told you that she enjoyed it very much. So. Okay. Yeah, I, I did too. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Yes. Thank you very much. Sue. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. And I hope we see each other soon in the fitness room or the yeah. pool or wherever. In the hallways here at Vine. Yes. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Thank you all for being here today. Yep. Bye. 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 -bye.